please join me in welcoming Arun Gandhi. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction from Zoe, and I'm honored by it. I'm honored to be here and to learn about all the wonderful things that uh, this group is doing. I'm almost speechless. I don't know what to say because I think everything I have to say is redundant after <laughs> seeing all the great work that uh, all of you are doing. So I thought I'll share with you what my grandfather and my parents thought about humane education and how they approached it. In my grandfather's case, he believed that education must use the three components in every human being, and that is the head, the heart, and the hands that all these three have to be uh, involved in transforming a person, in educating a person. The head, of course, is about giving the child the knowledge about various subjects, writing, reading, and all of that. But the heart is something that we tend to neglect. And that is about compassion, about understanding each other, about learning about each other, about showing greater compassion, showing our connection with all of creation, showing the inter interconnection between all human beings, that we, don't, we may live in nations, but we cannot preserve our part of the world if the rest of the world is going down the tube that we are all interconnected. And if some uh, country or some continent uh, far away from us is perishing, we are going to feel the effects of that, and we are going to perish too. So the stability and security of every nation depends on the stability and security of the whole world. And it's our responsibility to do that. So that is where the heart comes in. The hands, of course, are about to work. And we were made to work uh, when I was uh, learning with him, uh, staying with him as a 12-year-old boy um, for nearly two years. And then, of course, my parents did the same thing, too, that we had to do all kinds of work. Everything from working on the farm, planting, growing, hoeing, cleaning, uh, washing, cleaning dishes and uh, cooking and everything. I mean, there was not a single thing that we could say that this is not my job. Anything that needed to be done, you had to do it. Cooking, you know, it, it made us so independent that my wife was often frustrated with me. I say, you don't have to depend on me for anything. If I don't cook, you go and cook your own meals. <laughs> anyway. And it was all because of that training, because we were made to do everything ourselves. When we were in school, um, it reminded me after seeing that uh, video about saving uh, all that garbage that we make here. Yeah. When we were in school, we were given plates, brass plates, and brass cups, and brass bowls, and spoons, and forks. And after our meal in school, each student had to go and wash their plates and, and spoons and everything, and put it away safely in the locker. They were responsible for it. They were we were responsible to maintain it and responsible to keep it. So that is how we were taught to be, be self-sufficient and to be able to do all kinds of works. And these are the three components of his uh, education policy 
that uh, I think are very important for us to uh, understand and uh, think about. But during that two years, I learned much more from him than just the education part of it. For instance, I learned that my grandfather's first influence in the philosophy of nonviolence came from my grandmother. Now, not many people know about this, but it was my grandmother who really indirectly taught him the importance of nonviolence and uh, anger management. And this happened when you know, they were both married at the age of 13, which was a normal practice in those days in the 1800s for people to get married very early in life. They were both married at the age of 13, but they started living together at the age of 16. And at that age, grandfather said that he didn't know who was going to be the boss, who was going to lay down the rules and, in, uh, and enforce them. And so he started going to the library and reading books on the subject. And obviously, all these books were written by male chauvinists because they all talked about how the husband should lay down the rule and enforce it strictly. So after reading this, he came home one day and he told grandmother that from tomorrow, you are not going to stir out of the house without my permission. That is the law and you are going to obey it and I want no arguments about it. And of course, grandmother didn't say anything at all. She just quietly went to bed didn't respond, didn't retort. She went to bed, got up the next day, and she continued to do what she always did. <laughs> continued to go out and visit and never bothered to get grandfather's permission. And so a few days later, when he realized that she was not obeying him, he confronted her again, and he says, how dare you disobey me? Didn't I tell you that you are not to go out without my permission? And at that point, very quietly, without losing her temper or becoming aggressive or angry, very quietly she said that I was brought up to believe that we must always obey the elders in the house. And I believe the elders in this house are your parents. Now, if you're trying to tell me that I should not obey your mother but obey you instead, let me know so that I can go and tell your mother I'm not going to obey you anymore. <laughs> and of course, grandfather couldn't tell her to do that. And so the whole matter was settled <laughs> without anybody getting angry or uh, even breaking up a relationship. And grandfather acknowledges after that 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 was the most profound lesson in nonviolent conflict resolution that he learned at the age of 16. And that became the cornerstone of his philosophy. And everybody who came to him, whether to learn as children as we did, or whether to learn about nonviolence as adults, the first thing they were taught about was anger management that we need to understand our anger and need to use that energy positively and constructively rather than abuse it. It, it was a very important thing to him because even in those days, he realized that anger, the abuse of anger, was responsible for a lot of violence that we experience in our lives. Today, we are told by experts that more than 80% of the violence that we experience in our lives today is generated by anger. We get angry and we say things and we do things that some, sometimes changes the course of our lives completely. So for grandfather, in his education program, learning about anger and being able to channel that energy into positive action became a very important part of uh, our lessons. We were told that anger is like electricity. 
It's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we learn to use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse the energy and cause death and destruction. He suggested that I write an anger journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. I did this for many years and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to deal with uh, anger constructively. But when I talk about this today, a lot of people tell me that they've been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped them. Because every time they go back and read the journal, they are just reminded of the incident and they get angry all over again. <laughs> because they pour their anger out into the journal. And that is not very effective. Simply pouring it out into the journal, getting it out of your system, gives you temporary satisfaction. But if you don't write the journal with the intention of finding a solution and then commit yourself to finding it, you will not be able to uh, use that energy positively and constructively. So it's very important that we learn how to write the anger journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem. But I learned during his, the time I was with him about his philosophy and about all of these little things that he taught us uh, during the course of the day. And I always felt, like most people today, that when he talked about nonviolence, it was only about putting an end to uh, wars or putting an end to the violence that we experience in the cities, in short, that it was all about external violence. But it was only when I grew up and I began to reflect on his philosophy and the things that he taught us as children that I realized it was more about dealing with the internal violence within ourselves before we could put an end to the external violence that we experience outside. Today we can work for peace for endlessly for months and for years and not achieve it. Because we cannot achieve peace if we don't have peace within ourselves. We've got to create the peace within ourselves. We've got to get rid of all the violence that exists within ourselves before we can put an end to violence externally. And I learned this lesson from him through a little pencil. During the time when I was there, and one day while I was coming back from school, I had a little notebook and a pencil in my hand, and I just happened to look at the pencil. It was about three inches long. And I thought to myself, I deserve a better pencil. This is too small for me to use. And without a second thought, I just threw that pencil away because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I met grandfather and asked him for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. <laughs> he wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. <laughs> and I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do. He has a flashlight. <laughs> and he sent me out with the flashlight to look for this pencil and I must have spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn 
two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that is the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we overconsume and throw away and waste every day, that all of that is either violence against nature or violence against humanity or violence against both. We just saw in the, uh, in the film the, the food that was being dumped in the cafeteria. That could feed so many children around the world. Today we are living in the 21st century and we consider ourselves to be civilized, not only in this nation, but so many nations, uh, we are all educated and civilized human beings. And yet, hundreds of millions of children are dying every day of starvation and neglect all over the world. Every 31 seconds, a child is dying of starvation. And what do we do about it? We can't. We don't do anything because we say, well, what can we do? But we can do little things that can make a big difference. And those little things are to instill in our own children the value of preserving everything not taking any more food than they need, and not wasting food. I was in a school in uh, Portland, Oregon uh, last year, and I started this program about s six years ago, rescuing the impoverished children in little villages in India who were being used as slave labor and girls were being taken into prostitution at the age of 10 and 11. And we started rescuing these children and giving them a home and education and, and means to earn some money so that they could uh, become uh, productive citizens uh, and do something for themselves. We now have about 160 children, and we are hoping that we'll be able to deal with more children. But I was at this middle school, and I talked to them about this program, and I talked to them about the millions of children who were dying every day, and that we, we need to do something about it. And all those children were moved, and they asked me, what can we do about it? And I said, you can do something in a little way. I told them, I said, you get pocket money from your parents every week. And you go and buy things that you don't really need. But you buy them because you have the money and you can afford to buy them. I said, if you, and I'm not denying you the right to buy something for yourself, but just buy a little for yourself and save half of that money to help a child somewhere else. And I said, there are about 300 students in this school if all 300 of you decided to do that, put aside a quarter every day, how much money do you think you can collect in a year? And how many children you would be able to feed in a year and, and uh, help in a year, building a school or something? And they took up this challenge. I was amazed. I just talked to them and went away. And I didn't know what was going to happen. There. But I was amazed that they took up this challenge. And within about a year and a half, they sent me a check for $7,000. And that has helped so many children uh, in our program itself. Now imagine if all the affluent schools 
or even normal schools here, taught the children this kind of thing, got them involved in larger issues and in small ways how they can make a difference in, in the lives of other children other, in other places of the world and instilled in them that compassion and their responsibility to do some things, however small, towards making this world a better place for future generations. These are things that should be a component of our education system, where we can encourage young children to become more conscious instead of greedy, and just buying things for themselves and, and enjoying life for themselves, that we need to make some sacrifices so that we can create a better world for ourselves. There are many other uh, aspects of his philosophy and uh, in humane education about building re uh, relationships with each other. This is again something that we don't really deal with very much. And the result is that our relationships today are based on self-interest. What am I going to gain from this relationship? And if I don't gain anything from that relationship, why should I bother to cultivate a relationship? And that is a very negative way of building a relationship. And that is why when we stop getting anything from the person, we break up a relationship, and every time we break up a relationship, we are causing the potential for a conflict. Now, in an ideal society, we were taught that relationships must be built on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation which is very important because today a lot of young people and even older people think that we are independent individuals and we can do whatever we like and it's nobody's business. We are not independent individuals. We are interdependent, interconnected and interrelated. Not only as human beings but with all of creation. And it's only when we respect that and that we will reach an understanding of who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are here not by accident. We are here to fulfill a purpose. Each one of us has a purpose to fulfill. But we don't understand that purpose because we look at life as existing from birth to death, going around in circles, just uh, making money, getting married, raising a family, dying, and going on in circles in the same way. Right? But life is about going up, growing up, not simply in terms of material gains, but in spiritual and ethical and, and uh, uh, moral gains also that we must become better than we were yesterday. This was something that my grandfather insisted, told me always, every morning you got to get up and tell yourself that you are going to be a better human being today than you were yesterday. And to be able to do that, I had to have a list of all my weaknesses. And every day I had to tackle those weaknesses to convert them into, into strengths. And some of them I couldn't do it immediately. Some of them I still have to work with uh, even today. And that is what education and, and uh, growing up really means. That we become better human beings. We stop looking at ourselves and our own uh, uh, life and move away from all the I, me, and mine into a, a greater world and, and, and look at the whole world as our neighborhood, which needs to be transformed. And it's only when we are able to understand that concept of ours that we need to become better human beings, that we need to 
uh, transform ourselves. You know, we tend to look at Gandhi and King and, and all of these people who, who became great, and we think that they suddenly overnight changed and transformed and became great people. They didn't. They worked all their life at little things all the time, changing those little weaknesses within them and transforming them into great. And we saw them only when they became important people. It's like an oak tree. We see the oak tree only when it's fully grown and admire it and say, oh, what a wonderful tree. But how many hundreds of years it took to get to that stage? We didn't even look at it at that time. So that is what we have to do. We have to keep working at, keep chip, chipping at it and grow every day so that ultimately we become uh, great human beings. We may not reach the greatness that some of them did, but we can reach certainly somewhere that our life makes an impact on us, other people. And people will admire us for being in their neighborhood and having lived in their neighborhood and made such an impact on them. That is what the meaning of our life should be. And it's only when we understand that, that we will uh, we will be able to accept each other as human beings. Today we identify people by labels. We have so many labels that we have forgotten that behind those labels there is a human being. We have gender labels, religious labels, economic labels, national labels, you name it and we have a label. And we identify people only by those labels. We've got to remove all those labels and start looking at each other as human beings and respecting each other as human beings. And that is when we will appreciate our own humanity. So these are important issues that uh, my grandfather placed a lot of um, stress on and taught all of us. And I think it should become a part of the humane education program that all of you are so uh, involved in. It will make it complete and whole when all of these aspects are in, included in it so that they learn about themselves and how important their life is, uh, not only to themselves but to others also. I want to conclude with one final story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us, of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he in invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came there and did their best, but nobody could satisfy the king. And one day, an intellectual from another town came and uh, the king asked him the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. So the next day, the sage went to this, I mean, the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house, came back with a grain of wheat, and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course, the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace, and he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace and got, found a little gold box, and he placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every day he would open the box and look for an answer, and he couldn't find any answers. So a few days later, when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. And the intellectual said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish, and that will be the end of the story. 
But if you had planted this outside and let it interact with all the uh, elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I have come here today to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather and I hope that you will not let it rot and perish, but let it interact with all the elements so that all of us together can transform this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you.